This is Andy, KE4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper, and lesson six in the Technician Operator Element 2 exam course to get your Technician Class Amateur Radio License. In this lesson, we're going to cover the T1F questions, which is the last section in the T1 sub-element of the exam pool. So without anything more to say, let's get started. All right, in this lesson, we're going to cover the Station Identification Operating Standards, Special Operations for Repeaters and Auxiliary Stations, Third-Party Communications, Club Stations, Station Security, and FCC Inspections. All right, for the first question, what type of identification is being used when identifying a station on the air as Race Headquarters? Now, this is called a tactical call sign, and when hams volunteer for marathons or emergency relief, or anything like that, sometimes they get assigned a tactical call sign. So this is race headquarters or this is disaster operations is called a tactical call. When using tactical identifiers such as race headquarters during a community service net operation, how often must your station transmit the station's FCC assigned call sign? Now this kind of builds on the previous question. The answer is at the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during a communication. So this is just the normal identification that you would need to use as part of a, a normal communication. So just because you're using a tactical identifier or a tactical call sign as part of some event does not negate the need for you to identify yourself with your FCC assigned call sign every 10 minutes and at the end of a contact. When is an amateur station required to transmit its assigned call sign? All right, the same type of question. The answer is every 10 minutes during and at the end of a contact. Which of the following is an acceptable language for use for station identification when operating in a phone subband? The answer is English. You have a US FCC issued amateur radio license. The national language in the United States is English. Now the conversation you have could be in any language you want, but US amateurs have to provide their station identification in English. What method of call sign identification is required for a station transmitting phone signals? Well, for phone signals and pretty much any other mode you're using, you can transmit your call sign or your station identification via that mode. So for phone signals, you can identify yourself via a phone signal. However, keep in mind that you can always, no matter what mode you're using, you can identify yourself using CW or Morse code. So there are two answers, or there's two possibilities for this question phone signals, or CW. Which of the following formats of a self-assigned indicator is acceptable when identifying using a phone transmission? Well, I have never ever used a self-assigned indicator. Now, the answer to the question is you must provide your call sign followed by or preceded by a slant or some other mark or word which means slant, such as stroke or slash or whatever. Now, the way these are used sometimes that I've seen is that if you're operating on a net where there's a whole bunch of coordinated communication between a bunch of different amateurs, sometimes you can assign yourself an indicator to describe your role in that conversation or that club or that net. Now, usually it's a two letters or a couple letters like Whiskey 3 or, you know, Oscar Tango or something along those lines to describe your role. But it can come before or after your call sign, but it has to be separated from your call sign by a slant or a word that means slant or stroke or slash. Which of the following restrictions apply when a non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign station using a station under the control of a technician class control operator? The answer is the foreign station must be one with which the U.S. has a third party agreement. So third-party agreements allow non-licensed individuals, which are the third party, to communicate with a foreign station when supervised by a properly licensed amateur. Now the kick is, is that that country that you're talking to has to have an agreement with the United States to allow that type of third-party traffic. So as long as that agreement is in place to allow third-party traffic, um, and you're a properly licensed amateur radio operator, you can allow a non-licensed ham to talk to somebody from their home country or a friend in a, in a foreign country. Which indicator is required by the FCC to be transmitted after a station call sign? This is a little tricky, but it's good information. Um, the answer is slash KT, slash AE, or slash AG, 
when using new license privileges earned by CSCE while waiting for an upgrade to a previously issued license to appear in the FCC license database. Now, it sounds kind of confusing, but what that means is essentially when you pass your technician class license after before when you've never had a license before so you've never had a license you pass your technician class license you are not allowed to use your new license privileges until your call sign appears in the database however if you are upgrading from technician to general or general to extra you can use your license class privileges as soon as you pass that exam so if you want to use your general class license privileges, what you would need to do is use your call sign and do a slash AG saying indicating that you've been upgraded from a technician to a general. Or if you go from general to extra and you want to use your extra class privileges, you got to do your call sign slash AE to indicate that you're, uh, you've been upgraded to um, extra class until your new call sign appears in the database. Now what throws people off is the slash KT. Now there the novice license was basically done away with about a decade and a half, two decades ago. However, there are still some novice licensees out there. And when they get upgraded to technician class, for them to use the new technician class privileges, they have to use their call sign slash KT. So that indicator after your call sign basically just demonstrates that you have passed the exam and you're waiting for your new license upgrade from pre-existing license to appear in the database. What type of amateur station simultaneously retransmits the signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels? This type of station is called a repeater station. They're very, very popular. Essentially what happens is that you transmit a signal on a certain frequency. The repeater station picks it up and then retransmits it on an offset frequency, usually at a higher power, giving you a lot better range, um, so you can use a, a low wattage on a transmitter and then have a, a much, much higher range using the repeater. They're extremely popular in 2 meter and 70 centimeters, and they're fairly popular in 6 meter and 10 meters. So keep your eye out for repeaters. If you do any type of 2 meter or 70 centimeter operation, chances are you're going to use a repeater at some point. Who is accountable should a repeater inadvertently retransmit communications that violate the FCC rules? Now, the answer to this question is the control operator of the originating station. This is primarily concerned with message content, so if he says something that violates it or sends traffic over basically data over a segment that's not authorized for data, that type of stuff. For the most part, the repeater owner is in the clear. The control operator of the originating station is the one held accountable. To which foreign stations do the FCC rules authorize the transmission of non-emergency third-party communications? The answer to this question is any stations whose government permits it. So you can talk to any foreign ham as long as their government permits international communication, which is mostly all of them. Now we talked in a previous lesson about which ones are not allowed, but this one is a simple answer. It's any station whose government permits it. Don't overthink the question. Just uh, remember any station whose government permits it. How many persons are required to be members of a club for a club station license to be issued by the FCC? All right, the answer is four. So if you have four hams that want to have a club and get a station license for that club, all I have to do is apply to the FCC. So you and three of your closest ham friends can get a club station, no problem. When must the station licensee make the station and its records available for FCC inspection? Right, the answer to this one is whenever the FCC representative wants to look at them. So whenever the FCC comes knocking at your door, you better have your stuff ready because they're going to want to take a look. All right, now it's time for the T1F quiz. So take out a pencil and paper and number 1 through 13. I'm going to go through the questions pretty quick, so if you need more time, simply pause the video and take all the time you need. And when you're done with the quiz, you can go to hamwhisper.com, click on the exam answers page, and go to the T1F link, and that will give you the answers to this quiz. So with all that said, let's get ready and do the quiz. Question 1. What type of identification is being used when identifying a station on the air as race headquarters? A. Tactical call sign. B. An official call sign reserved for races drills. C. SSID. Or D. Broadcast station. Question 2. When using tactical identifiers such as race headquarters during a community service net operation, how often must your station transmit the station's FCC assigned call sign? A. Never. The tactical call sign is sufficient. B. Once during every hour. 
C. At the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during a communication. Or D. At the end of every transmission. Question 3. When is an amateur station required to transmit its assigned call sign? A. At the beginning of each contact and every 10 minutes thereafter. B. At least once during each transmission. C. At least every 15 minutes during and at the end of a contact. Or D. At least every 10 minutes during and at the end of a contact. Question 4. Which of the following is an acceptable language for use for station identification when operating in a phone subband? A. Any language recognized by the United Nations. B. Any language recognized by the ITU. C. The English language. Or D. English, French, or Spanish. Question 5. What method of call sign identification is required for a station transmitting phone signals? A. Send the call sign followed by the indicator RPT. B. Send the call sign using CW or phone emission. C. Send the call sign followed by the indicator R. Or D. Send the call sign using only phone emission. Question 6. Which of the following formats of a self-assigned indicator is acceptable when identifying using a phone transmission? A. KL7CC stroke W3. B. KL7CC slant W3. C. KLCC slash W3. Or D. All of these choices are correct. Question 7. Which of the following restrictions apply when a non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign station using a station under the control of a technician class control operator? A. The person must be a U.S. citizen. B. The foreign station must be one with which the U.S. has a third party agreement. C. The license control operator must do the station identification. Or D. All of these choices are correct. Question 8. Which indicator is required by the FCC to be transmitted after a station call sign? A. Slash M when operating mobile. B. Slash R when operating repeater. C. Slash followed by the FCC region number when operating out of the region in which the license was issued. Or D. Slash KT slash AE or slash AG when using new license privileges earned by CSCE while waiting for an upgrade to a previously issued license to appear in the FCC license database. Question 9. What type of amateur station simultaneously retransmits the signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels? A. Beacon station. B. Earth station. C. Repeater station. Or D. Message forwarding station. 